and we are live. Welcome to another live stream, everybody. We are live here at the Paramedic Coach YouTube. Tonight, what I'm going to be going over, I got the whiteboard out behind me. I got markers right here. What we're going to be going over tonight, this is going to be the ultimate starter guide tonight for helping you start EMT school, start advanced EMT school, start paramedic school. I know so many of you that watch this channel that are getting ready for school. This is, you know, mid-August. So I want to give you some good insight and tips on both sides of the coin, academically, and also some practical tips. I'll pull out the chair later. I'll talk to you heart to heart about a few things, why you're getting in school. We're going to start with the EMT level. Then we are going to move in to the ALS, which will be advanced EMT paramedic level. This video right here, watching this alone, will help you out tremendously, my friends. And also, before we even get started, we have been seeing tremendous results and tremendous success. Big shout out to all my students. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you've seen all the results from a lot of my students going through the video study course. If you want to learn more about that, how I help students pass school, pass national registry, click down below. There's a link there for lifetime access to my full video study course. And without further ado, we're going to dive into our first lesson. Now, here is one of the main things that I talk about, but I'm going to put in the work right now. I'm going to show you exactly why I say this, why I preach this all the time to my students. And here it is. If you understand anatomy and how the body works, then you're going to understand when there's an emergency, when there's a disease in the body, it's going to come naturally for you. When you have no idea of the anatomy, you are lost when it comes to emergencies. You get behind in class, and I don't want anyone to go that route. Now, if you are new here, you don't know who I am. My name is Evan, the paramedic coach. This is what I do day in, day out, every single social media out there. This is what we do. And I have my video course as well, which is my vault of videos. We'll talk about that later. But now, moving forward. Let's say you are a week out, seven days out, two weeks out. Maybe you're starting in January. Maybe it's August right now. The number one tip I can give you is to study content before you enter school. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give you three quick tips before we begin with the whiteboard. For getting ready for EMT school, there's three main pillars I want you to focus on. Okay. Anatomy and physiology is number one. Number two is starting to get a handle and understanding some of the main medical and traumatic emergencies. I'll name a few here. You know, asthma, COPD, anaphylaxis, right? Just name a few, right? Tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, heart failure, head injuries. That's all falls, traumatic injuries. That's a lot of what we see in EMS, right? That's only a handful of, in of injuries and diseases and emergencies. I would start with that. Third piece is your medical and trauma patient assessment, how we actually examine a patient, right? And if I, I'm going to give you a bonus. I'm going to give you a bonus, okay? I, I love to give out bonuses. Um, I would say skills. We're going to talk about skills later on for EMT. I'm going to give you some quick tips on how to get better at your skills. And, you know, I get so many messages from my students about what they're struggling with. So I try to do stuff like this and say, hey, here are the answers. Just watch this live. You're going to get them, okay? Um, now, for paramedics, I'm going to say it again, anatomy and physiology. Why? Because you actually start paramedic school with anatomy and physiology, my friends. Okay? So you either, depending on where you are in the world, either have to do anatomy and physiology to even get in, or right day one, you have anatomy and physiology. So if you don't get through that, then you're not going to go through. Okay? But if you understand that anatomy and physiology... Everything is so much easier, okay? And I always tell my students, look, I'm with you, okay? I'm with you. Physiology can be tough, by the way. I'm with you, okay? 
you know, when I first started learning a and I didn't love it. Okay. I had to train myself and I had to understand myself why it was important. Start with the anatomy. If you understand the anatomy, you have a shot. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Pretty cool. All right, cool. Now there's two more things for paramedic that we're going to, uh, I recommend to you, uh, pharmacology and meds and then EKGs. Okay. EKGs, understanding the basic rhythms, have your medic print out EKGs for you. Look at them. We're going to talk about that later on. Let's dive in some content. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to start off with EMT level. So if you're out there right now, if you are preparing for EMT school, get your notebooks out, get your pens out, get ready for the ride. Okay. This is a cornerstone lesson of EMS right here. Okay. Now here we go. This right here is my world famous heart blood flow lesson. But tonight I'm going to give you a twist on it. You are going to understand heart blood flow right now watching this video on YouTube. Before you even get into day one of school, I'm going to teach you heart blood flow. Not only that, I'm going to teach you right now what happens if this side of the heart fails. And if this side of the heart fails, and you are going to understand it cold in one lesson, one video, as I promised to you. Okay? That's number one. Then from there, we're going to talk about if the heart fails, why we get certain, whoa, what's this down here? Certain signs and symptoms. And it's all going to make sense. And you are going to understand not only the anatomy of the heart and how it flows, but you're also going to understand a disease called CHF that can be a chronic disease, but can also flare up and then boom, there you are on the call with a patient difficulty breathing and chest pain and you're the EMT or you're the AMT or you're the MAC. Ready? Here we go. So the first thing we need to know about heart blood flow is what we're looking at. Okay, here it is. Here it is. This big circle is your heart. You have Two main, how many? Two main factors of the heart. You have the atria, okay? A comes before V. So atria is on top. There's a right atria and a left atria. On the bottom, again, A before V. On the bottom, we have the ventricles, the ventricles, okay? Right ventricle, left ventricle. So right, right, left, left. Atria, A comes before V. Atria goes first, the bottom is the ventricles. If you were to say, Evan, which one is more important? Which one is more stronger? I would say they're all important. They all are important. But if you look, I purposely do this dramatically on purpose. If you do not have ventricles, okay, you cannot get the two main, how many? There's two main jobs the heart has to do in a normal condition. I'm going to teach you normal first before we can move on to a failure. Okay? Make sense? If we don't know how the, the bike operates normally, how are we going to fix the bike? Okay? So there it is. Now, one more pearl I'm going to tell you about. Over here. You see it? Okay, now I'm going to move in and tell you. If, if you can't see it, just in case. Okay? Artery has A in it, right? Artery, think, goes away from the heart in heart blood flow. Arteries go away from the heart in a heart blood flow. I'm showing you how blood flows through your heart, how the heart gets oxygen, and how we actually get blood to flow through our bodies every second like that. Okay. Now, veins, or we, or we could say the venous side or the venous system, however you want to say it, I'm going to call it veins, okay? Come back to the heart, go towards the heart. So arteries, away. Veins, come back to me. Arteries away, veins come back. So we start our heart blood flow journey all the way over here. With me? Make sense? Okay. We start our heart blood flow journey right over here. And for anybody watching right now, if you watch this video over again, so if you're live right now, excellent. If you watch this video over again, 
let's say in a few moments here you have a light bulb. Oh, man, watch it over again. You're going to nail it down, okay? My advice. Now, over here, what did I write down? Well, I have the SVC and the IVC, okay? So in medicine, medical terminology, okay, well, superior means above. Inferior means below, okay? Make sense? So superior, above. Inferior, below. Inferior, throw it on the ground. Superior, put it on a shelf. Hang it up. Make sense? Now, veins go towards the heart. Superior, vena, cava. Inferior, vena, cava. It's part of the venous system. It brings blood back towards the heart. The SVC and the IVC. So, we have blood here right now that is returning from the entire body going back to the heart to do what? Get more oxygen. We need more oxygen. And our, our big player, our big player, the right ventricle, is going to get us that oxygen. More on that in a moment. So blood that does not have oxygen because we already dropped it off with all the cells all the way out there. Now we're going back to the heart. Now we're in the right atria. Okay, here we go. Now, what did I say about the atria? The atria needs to pass down. So A before V, atria first. We pass down to the stronger ventricle. Okay? Notice. Here we go. There's a valve here. Tricuspid valve. Okay? There it is. Now, we move to the right ventricle. Here is what I like to call giving the ventricles a job to do. This is the main key with understanding this. If we give the right ventricle a job and the left ventricle a job, we'll never forget the steps, ever, okay? So here it is. The right ventricle says, oh, man, I need oxygen so bad that I really need oxygen. Where am I gonna find oxygen? Where in the body might we find oxygen? Just at, as a lay person, where is the oxygen? In my lungs, in my lungs, okay? So, if I go here, all right, and I make a pathway from the right ventricle over here to the lungs, and I told you earlier that arteries go away from the heart, okay? If I, I could call it, the pulmonary artery, that makes sense. There it is, the pulmonary artery. So the right ventricle has a job to do. It needs oxygen. We've created a pathway, the pulmonary artery. Arteries go away from the heart to go to the lungs to get oxygen. Makes sense. So now here we are in the lungs. Right ventricle is like, yes, we got oxygen. But now, well, how do we get back to the heart? Veins go towards the heart. I'm going to make a pulmonary vein. That sounds nice. Here we go. Pulmonary vein. There it is. Pulmonary vein. We're back. Now we're in the left atrium. Now, what's the big thing about the left atrium? Oh, I'm going to pass down to my left ventricle. There it is. Mitral valve. Okay. Left ventricle. Beautiful. What's the job of the left ventricle? Pump that new oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. And the left ventricle has a best friend. So think about it like this. Who is best friends with the right ventricle? The lungs. Who is best friends with the left ventricle? The aorta. So without getting too crazy with the drawings, Looks like we're on Mad TV with uh, that coach. Okay. <laughs> Who's old and got that one? Okay. <laughs> we're going to go this way. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to pump to the aorta. Okay. And hook down. All right. Uh, that's where we go. Who got that? Someone had to get that. Come on. All right. <laughs> to the aorta. Okay. I'm not funny about a try, guys. Let me guess. Okay. So we're going to pump blood to the aorta. And there it is. 
So that's heart blood flow in a normal circumstance. We know that veins go towards the heart, SVC and IVC come into the right atria, bring it down, right ventricle, best friends of the lungs, we need O2, pulmonary artery to the lungs, got it? How are we getting back to the heart? Pulmonary veins to the left atria, okay. Slide down, excuse me, slide down left ventricle, pump to the body, parapodia aorta, you can go right here, probably feel your aorta. Okay, there it is. And we're going down. So some goes up, some goes down. There it is. So now they understand this, okay? Here's where we get to the next piece. So the next piece here, my friends, is we now have to, now we know what happens normally. So now what to do is figure out what happens when the heart fails. So what I talked about earlier on was, let's say we know how to operate a bike and the bike moves, right? If the bike falls apart, we need to know how to fix it, right? What's the machinery look like inside this heart, okay? So now let's do that, okay? Now, if the left side of my heart fails as a pump, blood backs up. So here's the big key, friends. When we have failure, when we have heart failure, blood backs up. Blood backs up in heart failure. So what does that mean? We back the system up. If the left side of my heart, left side of my heart fails as a pump, the blood or the fluid, which is blood, is going to back up left ventricle, left atria, and it's going to back up in the lungs. And now we have fluid in our lungs. Hang with me. It's going to make sense. Hang with me. Okay? If the right side of, if the right side of my heart fails as a pump, what's going to happen? Right ventricle backed up, right atria, backed up to the venous system. What do we get? JVD. What do we get? Leg edema. Whoa. That sounds just like the sign symptoms of CHF. And now we understand it because we know heart blood flow. This is why anatomy and physiology, I have an entire anatomy and physiology course, over 120 videos, just on AMP inside my course. This is why I go over every single medical and traumatic emergency disease inside my course, and we pair them together. And that's how my students get success. Right here. Now let's go a little deeper. Job. Okay. Look. A CHF patient, pink frothy sputum, that's a buzzword. Now, I don't like to train you to just pass a test, but I, I will tell you something, okay? If you have a test question and they say the words pink frothy sputum, it's CHF all day long, 100%. I don't like telling you that, okay? But it's true. It's always been there. It's a buzzword. You'll notice there's certain buzzwords you'll find on exams. Pink frothy sputum is CHF all day. Okay? Now, let's go back to it. JVD, that can be many things. Okay? Rails, bilaterally. We're going to talk about what that is. Leg edema. We're going to talk about what that is. Okay? Now, knowing that if you're watching this video right now, you could be so who we have, it could be EMT, AMT paramedic. Let me know in the chat if you are getting ready for EMT school right now. If you're getting ready for AMT school right now or paramedic school, if you're studying for AMT, let me know about you in the comments right now. Where are you tuning in from? Like this video right here, this live right here, and share it with your classmates. If you got a group chat, say, yo, check this guy out. He's doing some cool stuff. Share it out. So going back to this. The left side backs up, we get rails, bilateral rails. That's why we get it. Why do we get leg edema? That's the right side. Why do we get, get JVD? That's the right side failing. Why do we get pink frothy sputum? Because you literally have fluid and you're coughing it up. Blood, right? There it is. That is your CHF patient, right? Now, I want to give you a, a little something here about CHF. 
I'm going to grab my chair from over here real quick, okay? And we're going to talk now about some EMT practical tips, and I want to give you a few more pearls sitting down here about CHF. Let's have a chat. Here we go. Let me get the chair. The old chair, folks. The old chair. Okay. Here we go. I'm back. So, the first thing, now we understand this and we, we've gone through all this, is we have to understand the actual CHF patient. I want to give you some pearls, just some quick pearls you can take with you. Someone who has CHF, it is a chronic disease. So they are on a whole host of medications to combat this problem. You are called in the ambulance when this patient has an acute flare-up of their CHF, which means, can mean a few things, but I'm going to tell you, the patient could have gained weight in the form of excess fluid, and they have a weak heart. Excess fluid with a weak heart doesn't sound very good. So this is crazy, but I'm going to share it with you. This is true, true, true stuff here, okay? It's going to sound crazy, but it's true. There are some CHF patients that can have a flare-up only gaining two, three, four pounds worth of weight. They flare up. So if you are a, let's say, a visiting nurse, or you're out there as a community paramedic, to give you an example, okay? What you would uh, see in your patient is, whoa, we don't want our patient gaining weight, okay? It would CHF, right? Weight gain can mean you're about to end up back in the hospital, okay? That's number one. Now, here's number two that I get asked a lot. Evan, can both sides of your heart fail at once? Of course, that's not impossible. Absolutely not impossible, okay? That's number two. Now, here's the, the third piece I want to tell you about CHF. W what if somebody has CHF-like symptoms, but they don't have a history of CHF? What does that mean? That means they're probably having a cardiac event right now. What, 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 what's a cardiac event? That means they're having a heart attack. So hang with me. Well, the heart could fail by the muscle of the heart dying due to a heart attack. So you'll get these symptoms in somebody who's actually having a heart attack, All right? So when we talk about CHF, when we talk about a heart attack, where that patient's going to end up eventually, and I'm not gonna get too technical, in this live, I, I just wanna give you the buzzword. They're gonna end up in something called cardiogenic shock. Just me giving you that buzzword, you go, oh, what's that? It's when you become hypotensive due to a heart attack or due to CHF. I'm going to keep it there for now for you, okay, for my new folks. Just remember that buzzword. It's going to help you, okay? It's going to help you a lot. Now, this is our EMT lesson. I want to move into some practical tips. I'm going to keep the whiteboard up for a few seconds. If anybody wants to copy it down, go ahead and do that. Uh, we're going to move into the next uh, little piece. Having fun? Smash that like button, everybody. Um, and hey, I want to thank you all for uh, 34,000 subscribers, everybody. Let's go. I mean, man, to think, my friends, we were at 2,000 2, subscribers last year. And it was like March or April of 2020. We were at 2,000 subs. We are now at 34,000 subs. Let's go, everybody. Come on. Woo. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I uh, really appreciate you all watching. You know, I, I, this is what I love to do. I think about this every day. I'm a total nerd and I'm happy I can help you. <laughs> all right. So I love it. Okay. So we're going to move into practical tips. I'm going to clean the board. And it, now we don't worry. It's a replay. Don't worry. It's a replay. Okay. But I'm going to erase this. Okay. And by the way, I hope you like my style. If this is your first live, I hope that, you know, gave you some light bulbs. Now, let me tell you something. If you're brand new to EMS and you're getting ready for EMT class, just watch this video right there. You're already ahead of the game already. You're already miles ahead of the game already. So great job. Okay? I, I wish I knew that before I went to EMT school. I didn't know that. Okay. 
All right, folks. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some practical tips. I'm going to get close to you here. Let me see if I can move this uh, chair over a little bit. Well, I kind of get a good picture for you all here. That's good. All right. So let's now talk about some EMT practical tips that I, I want to give to you. This is like on the road stuff as a new provider. So first thing I want to tell you about, here it is, you can see his arm a little better, is you're going to learn about different uh, pulse points. So here are, my, here are my two fingers. Your radio pulse is right here. Okay. We got that down. Now, there's a pulse point right here that I want to talk about with you. Okay. Let's say we have our blood pressure cuff. We put the cuff on right here. There's a little uh, arrow you're going to see in the blood pressure course. It's artery. Take your two fingers right now if you're watching. Everybody can do it. Okay. You're going to see there's a ridge right in here in your arm. Okay. If you go right here and you press down on any patient, any patient out there, it could be elderly, it could be whatever, this patient, you will feel a pulse here. I'm going to give you a pearl. If you, if you have a hard time finding the radial pulse, when I first started EMS, like you, I had a hard time finding the radial pulse, just getting used to it. You know, it's a smaller pulse point. I found that this is, if you can find this pulse on anybody. And, you know, like I remember being new. You know, yes, you want to get the radial pulse, but it's the same pulse, my friend. It's the same rate, right? Here, here, anywhere, okay? So what I'm trying to get at is this. Don't be afraid to start taking pulses from here. It's a great spot. This is where you're going to put the head of the blood pressure cuff. So a lot of people that are new, what they do is they mess up, and they put the, the, uh, the scope all the way over here, right? So I'll show you real quick. So here's the scope. It's our friend Tacky over there. You guys named him, not me, but that's our boy, okay? Here's our scope, and we're gonna talk about scopes in a minute, okay? I'm gonna debunk some myth. So here's our arm. So what, the, what a new student may do is put it over here. It needs to go over here. Now here's the crazy thing. With this scope right now, as I'm live with you right now, I'm giving you real feedback. If I just close my eyes and listen, I'm gonna do it right now for you. I can hear underneath with the scope. I can hear the I can hear the heart pumping from here. That's your blood pressure point. That tip alone plus adding a Littman scope to your arsenal will help you tremendously. Now, people talk about, okay, what should I get for supplies? Honestly, you should just go and buy a Littman Classic scope. Now, there may be people in the comments or people online or other, maybe even an instructor saying, oh, you don't need to do that. You know, just get a, just get a cheap scope. If you're a good provider, you can listen to a good scope. Okay, how much do you care about your patients? Do you want to absolutely know you're going to hear the vital, the vital signs? Or do you want to, man, I really hope I hear it. Also, some people happen to be hard of hearing as well and need a good scope. Here's the thing. These, these Littman scopes last years. Like, scopes can last, like, this scope, okay, this, my friends, this scope, this is a Cardiology 3 scope. Do you know when I bought this scope? I bought this scope, I was, I was like two or three years into being a paramedic. So to give you some idea, when I bought this scope, let's, let's, do, some, let's do some math here, if you will, okay? 2012, I was in paramedic school, graduated 2013. Let's say I bought this scope 2015, 2016. My friend, it's 2021. This works fine. There it is, okay, pretty cool. So that was my practical tip for the EMT level, okay? I, I do, I do recommend it. Um, you can literally just go look up Lipman Classic. That will do the job for assessments. You know, once you get your paramedic, like, like what I did, uh, when I got a paramedic school, I wanted to give myself a gift. I said, you know what? I'm going out and get, I'm going out and getting the, uh, uh, the Lipman Cardiology. That's what I got, right? I, I think that was the second, second one that I got of that. 
Um, either I lost, I think either I lost it or I got like a crazy call or something like that. One of the two, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, literally still works. So my advice. Okay, so now we're gonna move into ALS land. Here we go, folks. So I'm gonna get a little water here. Okay, a little water for me. Cause I gotta stay hydrated. Okay, I have the lights on me. And we're gonna continue. Um, my friends, we got 58 people on the live. Hope you're doing well. Uh, if you haven't yet, smack the subscribe button, everybody. Hit subscribe right now to the paramedic coach. This is the number one. And look at the stats. It's true. This is the number one EMS education, uh, most busy, most active uh, platform out there. Um, I post content every day, every day. Uh, days I don't post content or days where I'm telling you, hey, I got a video on here, so more content here. Every day I post Facebook. Every day I post Instagram. I post weekly, sometimes a few times a week. I have shorts. I have long-form videos on YouTube. I've created a 400-plus uh, video study course to help prepare you for EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic. That's where I send all my students for national registry prep. We believe in content over questions. You understand the content cold. The questions become easy. You can learn more at prepareforems.com. Lifetime access to my video study course to get this stuff down cold. The link down below. Check it out now or check it out as live. I'm cool, whatever you want to do. But we got more to talk about. <laughs> all right. We'll get a little water, folks. Have fun. I'm having a good time. <laughs> and I'll give you one tip. When you're working on the ambulance and you're you're new, especially if you're not used to a job where you're kind of on the go and moving around, it's going to sound tried and true, but I do recommend drinking a ton of water, as much water as you can, more, more than you usually do. You know, I would add extra liter, you know. Um, you're going to need it. So let's talk about ALS land. Here we go. Now, we talked about earlier that anatomy and physiology, pharmacology, right, EMS medications, cardiology makes the paramedic a paramedic, right? right. So what I'm going to go over right now are some of the basics of pharmacology. Excuse me. As you need to know, going into advanced EMT, or paramedic school. Now, if you're an, a, an advanced EMT watching this, understand that AEMT is basically, right, you're taking everything you learn from EMT, and you're learning about, about 40, 50% of what you would learn in paramedic school, and you're doing a lot of the same skills, a lot of the same skills, okay? Um, but there's more medications, more pharmacology, more cardiology on the paramedic side, right? That's what AAMT basically boils down to, okay? This will help AMTs and paramedics because you got to know it. So here we go. So let's talk about this topic first. Now, I have a total of, let me see, one, two, three. Three different things we're going to go over. Here we go. Here's the first one. So the first one is agonist versus antagonist. By the way, I absolutely hate doing this where I have to turn my back to you and write, but it's only me here, folks, so I'll have to get someone to, to write on the board. See, I got my marker. <laughs> there we go. All right, so the first piece we have here, guys, is agonist versus antagonist. So an agonist is a drug that binds to a receptor in the body. I'll explain. Hang with me. An antagonist blocks a receptor in the body. Now, here we go. I want you to just think about this, okay? It's the way that I remember it cold. In the body, there are something called receptors. Okay, I'm gonna just draw a few different circles, okay? Okay, this right here, we're gonna call the alpha receptor. This receptor, we're gonna call the beta one receptor. This one, we're gonna call the mu, Opioid receptor. Okay? Give me an example. Give me some examples. Now, if a drug enters the body, it doesn't just enter the body and say, here I am, have an effect. 
The drug is the drug isn't just go into the circulation and say, all right, come on, let's get this effect going. No, no, no. It's gotta find a receptor, a friend, an ally to link up with. So depending on the drug, a drug could go to the alpha receptor and it could turn it on like a light. So you get the effect of the alpha receptor or it can block the alpha receptor so it cannot turn on. Thus we have an effect. Same thing with any receptor in the body. Same with all these. We're gonna go over more, a few more, but just so you, you understand, okay? Agonist equals turn on. Okay, agonist, we're gonna turn on the receptor. So if you can in your brain, I like to think about a receptor as a, like a light bulb that is off. So if I am an alpha agonist, I'm gonna go in, pull the cord, turn the light on, okay? If I'm an alpha blocker, I'm going to shatter the light bulb. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what I think about it, okay? So you never forget it. So the receptors are a light bulb. I can turn on, I'm an agonist, I can pull the old, old school cords, pull it down. If I'm a blocker, I'm gonna go <laughs> shatter the receptor. You're not turning on, okay? That's how you remember it. So an antagonist blocks the receptor. Another word that you may hear is, it competes at the receptor sites, okay? That is true too, okay? Now I'll show you some examples. Here's an example. Let's say your patient is on an opiate medication. Let's say they overdosed on oxycodone, oxycontin, heroin, right? Fentanyl, right? Morphine, Dilaudid. Oh, I'm naming a bunch of opiates for you. Hope that helps. Let's say someone overdoses on heroin. Let's go with that, okay? If I go here, that means this mu opiate receptor is turned on. It's turned on a little too much. Okay, let's say somebody overdosed on, let's say it was fentanyl, okay? If I give the patient Narcan, a drug called Narcan, also known as naloxone, we're gonna go over EMS meds in a minute, drug card style, so hang with me, okay? In this case, heroin's the agonist. The antagonist is Narcan. So now, Narcan goes to the site of the mu opioid receptor, competes, outbeats the heroin, blocks the, blocks the baby down like this, and now the patient wakes up and they're breathing again. That's what happens in the body. Wait a minute, didn't even say if we understand this, this A and P stuff, we'll understand medicines? There it is. And now, some of you, some of you, Maybe coming in and out. Hope you hear this. When you're doing drug cards, if you know what a drug does, the drug cards are extremely easy. If you ignore the mechanism of action, which is a fancy word for saying what the hell the drug does in the body, you will not do well with drug cards. When I teach my students drug cards inside my video study course, first link in the description, I have the main 50 EMS drugs in the course all laid out, drip card style, we're gonna go over. If you want that, click down below. Every single thing that I do is based on the mechanism of action, everything. If we don't know the MOA, throw away everything else. Don't forget that, it's so important. It's gonna be a cakewalk for you if you understand that, okay? Now, here we go. I'm gonna erase this. Actually, I'm gonna, let me do one more for you. I'm gonna do one more for you. I am gonna do, um, alpha and betas, and we're going to go into that in minutes. But let me just give you one more about this agonist and antagonist to make sure it hits home. Let's say somebody was taking a medication, right? Let's say they were taking a medication, and let's say that medication was low pressure, which is a beta blocker, okay? We would block the beta receptor down, okay? Epinephrine is going to turn on the alpha receptor. 
it's going to turn it on. Okay. So now we see familiar sounding drugs. They can turn on, they can shut off. Okay, cool. Now let's talk about alpha and beta receptors and some meds and why and why they're familiar. Let's get into that. Okay, cool, cool. Now, remember something very important. Drugs have two names. The brand name is the name that you hear on TV, right? So give you an example, right? A brand name of like metaprolol would be low pressor. Metaprolol would be the generic name, right? So adrenaline, which is actually in some areas is the brand name for epinephrine. Epinephrine is a generic name. Now, I would say, and my colleagues, you want to put it in the chat when you think about this? Please let me know what you think. I'm, I'm all ears. Okay, let me know what you think. I would say eight out of ten times, if, I, if you pick up, pick up a pill bottle, it's in the generic name. Do you agree? Disagree? Let me know. I'd say about two out of ten times it's the brand name. For example, if I pick up, pick up a bottle of Lipitor, which treats high cholesterol, elevated cholesterol levels, it will say atorvastatin. It won't say Lipitor. Agree? Disagree? Let me know. Okay. So remember that there's the brand name and the generic name. Okay, very important. Another example I can give you, Narcan, brand name. Naloxone, generic name, right? Haldol, brand name. Halperidol, generic name. They sometimes sound similar, sometimes they don't. But this is part of your pharmacology. You're going to get drilled in it, so I thought I'd bring it up. So now let's talk about the alpha and beta receptors. Okay, here we go. Oh, we've been live here. 42 minutes. Not bad. Let's keep it up. All right, folks. So we got our alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. Now, excuse me. The reason these receptors are so important is this reason. A lot of the drugs inside of EMS act on these receptors. It's the alpha-1, the beta-1, and the beta-2 receptor. Now, I'm going to tell you something right off the bat. If you block or if you act upon turning the light bulb on to any one of the beta receptors, they are like twins. So just remember, these are like twins. I'll come back to it. Alpha one, put it by itself for right now, okay? If I turn on, pull the cord, and I turn on the alpha-1 receptor, I get vasoconstriction. Oh, come on, man. Here we go. This crazy stuff. Ah, oh, vasoconstriction. What are you talking about, man? Vasoconstriction. What is this guy talking about? I'm out of here. Get me off the line. Vasoconstriction. And that's not how we do things. We break everything down simply. Hear me out. And by the way, if you can do this with every single word in medicine, don't let it intimidate you. When I first started, these words intimidated me. They don't, they don't need to. You got to break them down, okay, like a building block. So look, vasoconstriction. Vaso, I'm talking about the vasculature in the body. I'm talking about the blood vessels in the body. The highways in the body are the blood vessels, okay? Remember we talked about heart blood flow earlier in this live? Well, we're pumping to all the blood vessels, right? Constriction means we're going to make the blood vessels more tight, so the blood pressure is going to increase. When our blood vessels are more wide open, our blood pressure goes down, okay? When our blood vessels are tight and compact and constricted, like a boa constrictor constriction, our blood pressure goes up. So I want you to think about alpha-1 as vasoconstriction, your blood pressure goes up. There it is. Okay? Equals BP. Now, BP is slang for blood pressure. Goes up. Okay? 
And by the way, if you're an EMT watching this, it's not going to hurt you to understand this. You're just going to know. Again, you're going to know more than you need to. You're going to come in class. So that's not going to hurt you. So beta 1. The beta 1 receptor has to do with the heart. Everyone and their brother from the West Coast to the East Coast to internationally knows this. I'm going to say it. Beta 1, we have one heart. <laughs> beta 2, we have two lungs. If you're a veteran provider, you've heard it a million times. It was drilled into your head. That's how I still remember it to this day. So beta 1 acts on the heart. What does it do? It increases the heart rate and increases contractility. Whoa, oh, come on, man. Another big word? Come on. Come on, man. This guy's ridiculous. Just tell me what it is. I've been there. I understand. Contractility is simply the strength of the contractions of the heart. The heart is a pump of the body. The heart's job is you pump blood every single second around your body. If we increase the strength of contractions, we have a more functional heart. That's beta 1. So when I turn, pull the cord, turn on beta 1 like a lamp, we get increased heart rate, increased contractility. Here is beta 2. So with beta 2, when I pull the cord, hey, got beta 2? Pull the cord. Turn it on. When I turn it on, I get bronchodilation. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Another big word. Now, I definitely spelled that wrong, but you will get the point. I have an extra T in there. My fault. Okay. Bronchodilation. Totally butchered that, but we'll get the point. Bronchodilation. Okay. So, what we have here is the highways of our lungs. Okay. Is the bronchi tree. It's the highways. The roads, the main system of the lungs is a bronchi tree. We have the big bronchi, we have smaller bronchioles, okay? And they're broken up in primary, secondary, and they move on from there, okay? We're going to open up the bronchioles. So when the bronchioles are tight, the bronchioles are tight. Let me try to get a good angle. Here. When the bronchioles are tight like this, you can't breathe. You're having an asthma attack. When I open up the bronchioles, I can breathe better. Now, here we are. When I activate alpha-1, blood pressure goes up, vasoconstriction, already went over that. You got it. Beta-1, increased heart rate, increased contractility. Beta-2, bronchodilation. Now, hang on a second here. Evan says, if I know what a drug does, then I'll know why to give it, and I'll know why not to give it. What if I told you there's a drug that acts on every single one of these receptors as a what? As an agonist. Yeah, that's it. Right. As an agonist. Because remember, agonist, pull the cord, turn it on. Antagonist, hey, I'm block, block you out, block you out. Okay? Epinephrine. The drug epinephrine, you may know, EpiPen, right? Right? Epi, right? Epi, right? So I am, I V, I am, okay? Epi acts on all of these. Now, without me even putting the drug card together, which I'm going to do for you in a, in a moment, and we're going to do a drug card here live for my people. I'm going to give you a free drug card right here, okay? Um, If you have a low blood pressure, maybe you're septic, I can give you this drug and raise your blood pressure. Because alpha-1 causes vasoconstriction, so your blood pressure goes up. So you got a patient who's septic, 80 over 30. You have to give them epinephrine to get their blood pressure back up. Epi does that. Beta 1. Ah, oh, my, my patient has a, has, a, has a low heart rate. Could I give Epi? You could. It's not the primary thing. 
but you could do it. Would it make sense? It makes sense. Well, increase the heart rate. Okay, that makes sense. What if I gave Epi to open the lungs up in an asthma attack or anaphylaxis? That makes sense. What if my patient was in cardiac arrest and the American Heart Association said, you know what? Why don't we just give them this drug? It causes vasoconstriction. They're in cardiac arrest. They have no blood pressure. They have no heart rate. What if we just give them this drug in cardiac arrest, epinephrine? Maybe they'll get a heart rate. You know, maybe they'll it'll just bring them back to life. That, that sounds good. That's epinephrine. That's epinephrine. And the reason why I go over epinephrine is if I was to carry one drug in the ambulance, I can only carry one drug, I'd carry epinephrine. He said, Evan, you got one drug, I carry epinephrine. Because it does so many things. And like, if you're an anaphylaxis, epinephrine literally saves your life. If you're having an asthma attack, epinephrine literally saves your life. If I'm at a cardiac arrest, at least I have uh, the first drug on hand, right? Pretty good stuff. If your blood pressure is low, I can raise your blood pressure. Your heart rate so I can bring your heart rate up. Wow. It's a life-saving drug. And I would say the best drug in all of of a Western medicine, okay? Let me know if you agree down below. If you could carry only one EMS drug, what drug would you carry? Let me know down below, whether you're alive or in the replay. I would choose epinephrine. You might agree with me. I know it's a good drug. Would you carry a man? I don't, I don't know. A butyrol? Let me know down below. I'm really, I'm actually really curious. Can you please comment down below? Please comment down below. I'm actually very curious what, what you would do. Now we're going to talk about the drug card. So like I said, inside my video study course, I actually break down all of the 50, 50, 5, 0, 50 of the main drug cards. That's only a part of the 400 videos that I have inside my video study course, link down below for lifetime access. What I'm going to do now is we talked about it. I now want to break it down. This right here is going to be one of the drug quizzes that you have on epinephrine. The other 49 I have inside my video study course. If you're getting ready for medic school or advanced EMT or you want to learn more, click down below. There's obviously sections for EMT as well. We'll talk about that later. But now let's move in to this drug card. Here we go. So somebody, I, I did see one comment. We have a lot to talk about tonight, so I'm not going to the comments like crazy. Um, maybe at the end we'll, we'll do a little comments, but someone said, are, someone had a great question. Are there two types of epis? Yes, I'm going over that right now. So hang with me, okay? So there are two different types of epis. Now, you know what? I'm a, that was such a good, whoever asked that, I, I admit, so many comments came in, but before I even do the drug card, which I could show you both in the drug card, I could do that. I actually want to, I was going to say it for the end, but I actually want to do it right now. So you actually just made me change my order. So good question. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. There are two types of epis. Let's talk about them, Michelle. So there's epinephrine, which we call 1 to 10,000. This is actually pretty good. I like this. I was going to say it for a bonus, but let's, just, let's tackle it right now, shall we? One to 1,000, okay? Now, if you, and you can do this later on, oh, there we go. You can do this later on, on your own, on your own time. You can, you can Google it. I want you to visually see it. I don't have Epi here, of course. There is a cardiac arrest epinephrine. It comes in a, basically like a goldish box, if you will. Almost the color of my, my logo, which is over in the corner over there. It's almost like that color. Almost the color of this, kind of. Not really. More like my logo, almost. Like a goldish color. Box. That epinephrine, that is called a Bristol Jet, that the epinephrine comes in, okay? Okay? It, 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 it's called that because you literally just put it together and then push the drug. It's very, you don't have to draw it up. You just put it together, boom, and you give the drug. With epinephrine 1 to 10,000, right, it ends up being 10 mLs. 
10 ml worth of fluid to give one milligram of drug. Now, before I say anything else, why is this one the cardiac arrest epinephrine? Because we don't put 10 mLs worth of fluid in our arm. We don't put 10 mLs worth of fluid in our leg. I mean for an intramuscular injection, my friends. We can put a lot more than 10 mLs. No, not of this drug. Hey, that's the dose, okay? But to give you an example, if I was, let's say someone was dehydrated and I was giving them normal saline or lactated ringers, right? That could be a, a thousand mLs in an IV bag. I can drip that in and I solve their problem through the vein. I don't put that in someone's muscle, okay? It's not a rule, but I always like to, to give an example of the drug uh, Zofran, okay? Not a rule, but it reminds me. It reminds me. Zofran is commonly the, for EMS. It is all different variations. Okay. If you look up the Zofran uh, green bottle, that you might, or, or EMS Zofran, maybe you can look that up. The drug Zofran comes four milligrams in two mLs. Okay. Now, could it be different? In a, yeah, sure, it could be. I always think that I really don't want to put more than like two mLs, around two mLs in someone's arm as an intramuscular injection. Not a rule, okay? But that's what I like to think about. So this epinephrine, the one to 1,000, is completely, completely different, right? So the dose for the cardiac arrest, which we're gonna talk about epi, is one milligram, right? Right. But there's 10 mLs in the Brissajet. With this, ep with this epi over here, one to 1,000, excuse me, you would look up on Google, epinephrine ampule, an ampule, A-M-P-U-L-E, ampule. And you'll see that we do indeed have one milligram of epinephrine, but it's only one ml. So how do you remember this? One, 10. One, 10. One, 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 one. Do not put 10 mLs in my arm, sir. Thank you very much. There it is. That's how you remember it, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you the dose for the intramuscular uh, epinephrine. It is 0 0.3 milligrams, okay? We don't give one milligrams in the arm, we give 0 0.3, okay? But in cardiac arrest, we give one milligram. IV, IO. IO would be into the bone marrow. IV would be IV. Pretty cool? Okay. So this is the big understanding. You will never, ever forget this if you remember, hey, don't put 10 mLs in my arm. You won't forget it. 1 to 10, think 10 mLs. 1 to 1, think 1 ml. There it is. Okay, pretty cool. So now, now, we, now I, I, I wish I had a, even, I, just, I wish I had the box to show you. I'm live, I can't like put a picture up. Um, but anyway, you can Google it and you will see it. You will indeed see it. You will indeed see it. Um, I, yeah, just to make sure that it was on Google, I, I, I've done videos where I put it in before. So I even checked you to make sure before the live. You can, if you Google those exact things I said, you'll find. Um, put, you know, uh, epinephrine, Bristol jet, and then you can also put in epinephrine ampule. If you want to really, really sure you find it, put uh, epinephrine EMS Bristol jet, epinephrine EMS ampule. You'll see exactly what it looks like. So just to, just to make sure you guys know, I did make sure it is out there. I've used it in videos too, so it's out there. Okay, so now let's do a drug card. Here we go. Here we go, folks. So this is what your EMS drug card looks like. So this would be like a drug card quiz. And I can actually quiz you actually right now if I want to, it's pretty cool. So we're gonna do epinephrine, 
to threaten to show up. And then I'm gonna grab the chair while we'll sit down. We'll sit down and talk. Man, I I wish I had, I wish I had this um, before I went to paramedic school. <laughs> I would have been so much more prepared, you know. It's, but I'm happy I'm here now to help you help you all out. Okay, epinephrine. So, what is the mechanism of action of epinephrine? We went over it. Epinephrine acts on as in. So, is it what is it? Brand name adrenaline. Generic epinephrine. What is it? Well, it, it's an agonist. Okay. I taught you that. It's an agonist. Yep. Okay, great. What does it act on? Alpha 1. Uh-huh. Got it. Beta 1. Uh-huh. Yep. Beta 2. Okay. Got it. Some of you may be saying it's a sympathomimetic. You're, you're right. I'm just keeping it calm, keeping it calm here. Okay. We got new students. Indication. Why we give it? Look at the MOA. Why we give it? Well, we would give it for cardiac arrest. Talked about that. What else? Why else would we give it? Knowing the mechanism of action, we talked about it earlier. Why we give it? Um, okay, alpha one causes vasoconstriction. Okay, so it's gonna increase their blood pressure. So if they're hypotensive, I can give it. Oh, yeah, that's it. You see, that's how you do it on the drug quiz. I'm being you thinking about thinking out loud. Okay, so axon beta one. Okay, um, increase their heart rate. Bradycardia. If they're bradycardic, epi will increase. There it is. You see, folks? I know the mechanism of action. I know the why behind the drug. So it becomes so much easier to get understand the whole drug card. I am going to fill in this entire drug card just knowing the MOA. All you got to do is plug and play the dose. And you can do this for every drug out there, but you got to know the MOA. You should be able with this to get an A on every single one of your drug cards and pad up that grade for paramedic school. People that do not listen to this, they will not do good in their drug cards. And then if they do bad on one test or bad on another test, they're not going to do well in school. Trying to give you a heads up here. Please listen to my advice. Okay. I've gone through it so many times. Please, I'm telling you, this is what happens to students. They either take action and they are successful. Or they don't, ah, oh, yeah, I'm not going to worry about it. And then they go, oh, how did I fail? Prep. Trust. Trust the process. Okay? Next up. What else can we do it for? Asthma, right? Yep. Anaphylaxis? Yep. Pretty cool. Okay? Got some good stuff on there. We, we learn right here on YouTube. We learn this right here. Okay, contraindications. Well, we're always going to put for a drug card an allergy. Epinephrine is a hormone in our body. If you go to the anatomy and physiology section of my course, you can learn more about that. Okay, where it is, what, what all that stuff. Okay, link down below. I'm going to say allergy though, just because. Every drug, if, you have, if you're allergic. Now, here's what could happen. You could take the drug, epinephrine, and have a bad reaction one time. And then on your chart, it's marked as an allergy. So this is why a drug, like epinephrine, while well, it's in your body, what do you mean? You could have an allergy to it. Maybe you had a bad reaction and then put it on the chart. So we're going to say an allergy. Okay. Now, what else? Knowing the mechanism of action, why would I not give epinephrine, epinephrine to a patient?
Would you give epinephrine to a patient who's hypertensive, their blood pressure is too high, or tachycardic, their heart rate's too high? No, you'd kill them. Right. So we're not going to do that. Right. Pretty cool. Now, if I jack you up, if I get your heart rate going, your blood pressure up, I open your lungs up, are you going to be a little anxious? Maybe you have a little tremor? Maybe you get a little dizzy? That's, an, that's called an adverse effect. Maybe your heart rate goes a, little, goes a little too fast. Blood pressure goes a little too high. Yep, that's it. So I'm going to put, for time's sake, because we're live, tacky, hyper-T, hypertensive. I would not write this down on a test, just for the board's sake, for time's sake, because we're live, okay? Dizziness. It be dizziness, but dizzy. Tremors. And, and I would say, yeah, anxiety. I would say anxiety. Anytime you jack somebody up, they get anxiety. A man of cocaine can have anxiety. Right? Now, here's dose and special consideration. Every single drug card in school will look like this. You'll have the title of the drug, brand, generic, class, mechanism of action, indications, contraindications mean don't give it. Indications mean you give it. Adverse effect means... Something that may happen to the patient. Not going to, we hope it's not a severe reaction, but it's some reaction. Every drug, every medication has an adverse reaction, right? So, for example, caffeine, right? Caffeine indication, I want to start my day, right? Adverse reaction, you're anxious, right? See? Every drug has it. Dose. I, do, I went over that a, a little earlier, but we split the, we split, for just for basics, we split the dose. So cardiac arrest would be one milligram, where if I was giving it for asthma, for example, it'd be 0 0.3 milligrams IM. Right? If you want to learn about the other doses for drips, other doses for inhalation, oh, what's that? Check it out in the course down below. You can learn even more about this drug in the course as well, and the other 49 other drugs, and another 400 plus videos. <laughs> special considerations. Okay. So a special consideration, I would say, with epinephrine, is watch out in elderly patients. And you're going to say, why? I'm gonna, you might know why, because you know the MOA, but I'm going to tell you why. And now it's time for us to have a talk. Let's do it. So, epinephrine. Epinephrine in elderly patients. When we're giving epinephrine the drug, you need to be at a severe emergency case. Epinephrine is an emergency drug, which means we give it to patients who are having a true bona fide you know, medical emergency, okay? It's not a drug uh, like an over-the-counter medication, excuse me, <clears throat> that we just give out uh, to patients like nothing, okay? This medication, we want a special consideration. Why I say watch out for elderly is because if you're giving epinephrine to somebody with a history of heart disease, with a history of a weak heart, with a history of heart attacks, that can cause an adverse effect. They might have another heart attack. Think about it. With alpha-1 receptors, we're causing vasoconstriction. With beta-1 receptors, we're increasing the heart rate. Now, here's the deal. What do you do? Most times, you're going to give the drug. In school and in life, I'm telling you, it would be a special consideration to watch out elderly patients. If you have a patient who's very elderly or a patient with a very extensive cardiac history, you want to really think, 
does this patient need epinephrine? If they're having a full-blown asthma attack, they need epinephrine? Yes. They're, if they're in anaphylaxis or they're trending anaphylaxis, which can cause your throat to swell up in like a matter of seconds to minutes, we've all seen that if you're experienced. Yes. Cardiac arrest. Well, they're in cardiac arrest already. We're going to give it. Yes. Right? We're talking about the, the septic shock case. Yes. Epinephrine is a life-saving drug. That's the key. One, one down, you have another 49 to go in the course. Okay? Pretty cool? Okay. Now, I'm going to erase the board here, and we're going to – I'll give you a few seconds here just to soak it in. Any last-minute notes? I'll get a little water, then we'll hang out. Okay, cool. That was some fun, folks, huh? No, no, it's fun. Got about 50 people on the live. Nice. Very nice. Let me know in the comments where you're tuning in from in the comments as well, everybody. Let me know in the comments down below. All right, folks. Going to erase this baby up. And we're going to talk about IV access. So this is our, I, I promise you, a practical uh, tip when it comes to the EMT, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, EMT and the paramedic level. For my AMT and paramedic, let's talk about IVs, IV access. I'm going to give you some IV tips. So here we go. So when we are doing an IV on a patient, I want to talk first about some common misconceptions. Common misconceptions. The first misconception is that every patient needs a, a, a large bore catheter. And the goal of the IV is to see to, if we can get the largest IV catheter possible in the patient. That's dead wrong. The whole goal of getting an IV is to either give a drip, give a medication, or have, ac or have IV access in case the patient condition changes fast. Now, in some areas, you may, for example, uh, be doing certain things where you maybe need to do a blood draw. Yes, that's a, of course, stuff like that. But for the most part, that's why we gain IV access for medications and EMS. Now, there are different IV gauges that I want to go over, okay? So you, you'll, uh, you'll get to know these, okay? 14, 16, 18... 20, 22, and 24, okay? 24 is a yellow color. 22 is blue. 14 is orange. 16 is like a silver gray kind of color. 18 is green. Uh, 20 is pink. Now, I'm going to separate these together. Okay, 18 and 20 are the most common sizes, it's kind of like the standard IV that you would do. Okay, 14, 16 aren't as popular nowadays, but they were for a long time when we used to pump, uh, you know, three, four liters of IV fluid into patients back in the early 2000s. <laughs> okay, but there's still nothing wrong with them, like you know, but they're still out there. Okay. But these are the biggest gauges. And then the 22 and the 24, those are the smaller IV gauges. I'll tell you right now, I've put a ton of uh, 22 gauge IVs in patients because they were tough sticks. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to get my access. I'm going to get a 22. Give my pain med. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. You know, um, cool. You know, I got the job done, right? Um, Better than not having an IV, right? So the 24, that's really for pediatrics. That's really for pediatrics. Um, could you say a tough stick? Yeah, but it's really for pediatrics. So what's the realm we're kind of playing with? Our goal is we want to get a decent sized catheter in the patient. We'd like to get an 18 or a 20 in the patient. If we could get a 22, 
that's fine. Um, it's oh, I this is my own personal opinion. It's not a um education rule. It's just, I'm just talking with you. We're hanging out. Okay, if I was your partner hanging out and talking with you, right? I would say your goal is to get 18, 20. If you have a tough stick, try 22. 24 is pediatrics. If you want to try these 14, 16, be my guest. But just know that you're not doing any great service to the patients by or, or helping them more by trying this and missing. Well, you could have got an 18 and it's fine. Okay. So my that my that's my spiel on that. So with that being said, here's my big tips. What a lot of people do, and I'm gonna go up to the camera here and show you. What a lot of people do is let me see if I can do this here. Is ah, I can't really do it like that. I'm just gonna show you here. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to come in with an angle like this with your IV. If you do. You can have a giant vein. I, I could show you, right? Okay, so if I can get my arm here, I'm gonna, you can see a vein right there. Where is that baby? Right there. Okay, see it right there? That's all vein right there, see it? Okay, that's, you don't, even, you don't even need a tourniquet for these veins, folks, okay? But if you can see, great, a beautiful vein right there. Okay, see it? No tourniquet. When I'm entering the vein, I see, see how that vein looks good, right? The vein looks good, but here's the issue. If I go, I'm going to show you on the whiteboard. If I go like this with the IV, the vein can look good. I'm going to go right through a perfectly easy vein. Let me show you, okay? Hang with me. Check this out. Please remember this because, you know, you don't want to miss an easy IV in front of your preceptor. Okay, here it is. So this is the actual vein. Okay, so let's say that's the vein that we see. Okay, we have our catheter. I'm going to draw in a minute, okay? Let's say, for example, we do not know how deep the vein is under the skin. Okay? Let's say this vein I just showed you, let's say that three, let's say for example, and this is, this is common, that three-fourths of it is actually on top of the skin. And this part right here is actually below the skin. So you see this big giant vein and go, oh man, I'm going to hit that baby, right? So watch. If you go at an angle like this, you're going to go right through the vein, and you're going, to, you're going to blow and miss the vein. Our goal with the catheter is to actually get, is to actually get the IV in the, the, the plastic catheter into the vein to keep it there. So you want to go at an angle more along the lines of this. Almost, you can't go exactly flush in, as close as you can. I'll draw it the best I can. It would be an angle more along the lines of this. That's, that's actually a little steep, but I, do you, I think we understand the point, okay? We're going almost a scoop. So watch. Versus. So don't, you're not going to be a fighter pilot going down. You want to almost like a scoop. So you're going to go, okay, there's the vein, level, level, okay? So there's the vein. You have to admit a little angle to start to hit it and then flatten it out. So like you're like a beaut so you're not a bomber pilot. You are like the airplane landing the tarmac. That's what you want to do. Flatten out your angle is my first tip, okay? Now I'm going to give you a, weird, a, a weirdo tip. Okay, here's a weirdo tip. Here's a weirdo tip. This is a crazy tip I learned uh, from somebody back in the day. I'll tell you. Here it is. Where's my arm? Here's my arm right here. Okay. So let's say I couldn't see a vein here on my person, right? What I can do is the first thing we got to do if we can't see a patient's vein is this. 
If I have my arm like this, like see how it's flat and level? If I have my arm, if I have my arm flat and level like this, I'm not gonna do as well. So the first thing I need to do is I need to put my tourniquet on. And they're good. Oh, you know, I have videos on that on the YouTube too. I kind of do tourniquet. If you look up, um, if you want to learn even more about this too, you can look up. Uh, it's, it's an old video. A, you're gonna see the old, the old studio, the old white wall studio. Um, back when I was really uh, getting the brand going here. Uh, look up the paramedic coach IV access, and you'll see a video. It's, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty cool video. Uh, but I go over a lot of this stuff. Okay, now. If you go like this, you want to bring the patients up. This is a little more slow. That was a little more fast paced. So this is cool. If you bring the patient's arm down, so if we're on the stretcher, let's say I'm on the stretcher, we don't want to bring it, we, we want to bring the patient's arm down as far as we can. Put the tourniquet on the patient. The first stage, we're gonna, if the patient, if the patient's awake, okay, I'm gonna say an, an awake patient, we're gonna say pump, pump, pump your hand, pump, pump, pump your hand. Like this, okay? And we're gonna lower the arm. Did you know that most nurses in the ED, when they're going for a tough stick, they usually wait about, they usually have the patient do that. They, they I'm just gonna tell you what, what they do. do. They'll, they'll, warm, they'll warm the site up. They'll put a tight tourniquet on, they'll lower, they'll warm, they'll, they'll warm the skin up, and they'll pump the hand, okay? Now, are we able to do that in the ambulance? Probably not. We don't probably have much time, okay? But sometimes we do. But I'm just telling you, that's like a hard stick way of doing it. So what can we do in the ambulance? Lower the arm, pump, pump, pump. Give it a little bit of time to get it going, okay? Now, this is what a hard, this is what any stick, but especially a hard stick, okay? Now, let's say we do that. Nothing comes up. I'm going to give you a quick tip. Let's say that you think you see a vein. You think you can strike on a vein, but you're not really seeing what you want to see. What you can do, this is, and try it. You take one tourniquet and you put it here. See that vein right there? Let's say we're going to strike that, but I kind of want to see it a little better. Lower the arm. Pump, 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 pump. We're going to put one tourniquet here. And we're going to put one tourniquet below the site. I told you it was crazy. I wasn't kidding. One above, one below. This is for hard sticks only. Okay? And then we're going to pump, 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 pump. Lower that baby. You're basically, you have two tourniquets. So you're trapping in between. The baby, the vein, might balloon up. I would say... With that technique, three out of four hard sticks you're able to get using I me using that technique. If I had a hard stick, that saved my butt. I give it to you. Okay. Now, if you include that tip with saying, "Hey, maybe I maybe I need to go for a twenty or a twenty-two here," the biggest difference, just so you're aware, when we're trying to get a vein uh, IV in somebody. It's not so much that the catheter is um, so uh, wide. It's that it, the catheter is it's longer in length. So we have a, it is wider, but the 22 is a very short catheter. So we can sneak a 22 basically anywhere in the body. It can even be a short vein or a vein that's going crazy ways. You can slip that 22 in there, okay? Again, if, you're real, if your patient really needs a medication, it's going, it's going to help them. Don't be scared. Don't be bullied. Come on, man. You, you, you can get 18. Well, if you have nothing to get, go with 22. I've done it. I know other people have done it. You can do it too. Okay? You don't want to go for, it for your first uh, attempt, but if you're having a hard time, try some of these tips out. I really hope it helps you. Okay? This is the biggest thing that happens to people with sticks right here. Because at the end of the day, all we're doing, like a plane is landing the catheter in the van. That's all we're doing. So if we can follow these rules here and we stick with them, we'll, we'll do pretty good. We'll do pretty good with IV access. Um, what I would tell you as an instructor tip is in school, 
when you do your, your IV lab, uh, I recommend staying after. I recommend doing every single extra time that you can with IVs. You, by the end of your schooling, will still feel that you want to do more IVs. I know I did. So like you're, you, like even when you're a new medic, you're going you're gonna to look at other medics. You know, uh, say myself, say um, other medics that have been doing this for years. And you're going to say, uh, and you're going to look at them, and you're going to go, they're going to give you their own little tricks. I gave you some of mine. The senior medics where you work, they're going to give you tricks and tips as well. Seek those advice as well. If you work with a medic, always ask them that. Okay? So, my friends, hope you enjoyed that little, little IV tip section there. And I'm going to give you a little wrap up. Okay, so here's my wrap up. Here's my, my wrap sheet, my wrap up for you. Here it is. If you are getting ready for EMT school, my friends, okay, if you're getting ready for uh, EMT school, the biggest thing that you want to do is you want to go over anatomy and physiology, okay? You want to go over medical and traumatic emergencies, okay? And you want to start going over your medical and traumatic patient assessment. Okay, if you're getting ready for uh, AMT or paramedic school, especially talk about paramedic school. Okay, anatomy and physiology, pharmacology and medications, and cardiology. Now, here's what I've done for you. Years ago, I sat down, I was a new medic, and I'm, I was getting so many new EMTs in the ambulance, and I kept seeing they had the same issues when they got out on the road or stories they were telling me about school, right? Started helping out EMT students. They were coming in with the same issues, same problems, right? Then I got more experience in the medic, started helping out other medics. And I realized they're having issues. They're having these problems. Helping medic students, they're having problems. They're having the same things. So here's what I've done. I've created an entire video library that takes you, the student, through from pre-EMT, concepts all the way through to your first day as a fully fledged licensed paramedic. I've created a video study course that gives you lifetime access. So no monthly payments It's a one time payment to get access to my video vault of 400 plus videos and access to our private community group. So you can ask me questions inside that private community group and inside that group we're in the thousands strong we're actually reaching uh, close to 5,000 people uh, inside that group right now right now here's the deal the course goes over in 120 plus videos from the chemical level all the way into the great organ systems Chemical, cellular, tissue, organs, organ systems, different diseases based on those organ systems. I have an entire anatomy and physiology course. It's a prep course for AMP inside of my course. If you watch these videos before you enter EMT or paramedic school or AMT school, you will be miles ahead. I even have people studying for national registry go through them so they understand the national core concepts better. Also inside the video study course, when you get to the end of school, you're gonna have your finals, your state exams, your national registry exams. I have helped more people than anybody else here online, helping people pass the national registry exams, and I have the results and the proof to back that statement up. You can look at my Facebook, look at my Instagram page, my students, get results. They have breakthroughs. They have light bulb moments and they pass national registry because they understand it's about understanding the content cold, not taking a ton of practice questions or reading textbooks. You have to use what works for you. And for a lot of students out there, video works for them. Does this video help you? Now, I include in the course with lifetime access, the national registry prep for EMT, advanced EMT, and paramedic level. Also inside the course, 
is what I call my EMS career and motivation section. Inside that section, I give you my best career advice. We talk about a variety of topics, and I also give you some motivation as well from me to you. Okay. Going on from there, I have an entire section devoted to EMT school prep. So what to watch before EMT school. I have an advanced EMT and paramedic section prep. What to watch before going into advanced EMT or paramedic school. I have the section I talked to you about earlier, which was the section based upon EMS medications. I have the top 50 EMS medications. I literally write out the drug cards for you. So if you're getting ready for paramedic school, I have created for you instant drug cards on the whiteboard, and I'm actually walking you through, holding your hand, and teaching you the drugs right here. On same view as this, same whiteboard. Okay. One thing that I noticed when I talked about those EMT students at the beginning was they were struggling greatly with prescription medications. I've updated all these videos, by the way, with a 2021 update. So all the content is new and fresh. All 400 plus videos are new and updated. Now, with prescription medications, if you understand a patient's medication list, if they overdose, they have a reaction, you know what it is. And it also helps you with confidence speaking with nurses and doctors, other medical providers. Okay. Now, the last piece in the course is very important. And this is why the video study course, the reason I created it was not only was not only my friends to help you pass school and national registry. This was my vision. And I'll tell you what the vision was. My vision was that you would have a product, you would have a program that you could actually go and watch and listen to and go back to to refresh and learn even while you're new out of the job. Do you know how many people reach out to me every day on Facebook or Instagram and the private message and DMs? And they'll say to me, hey, look, Evan, you know, I got through school. I got through national registry. But now I'm really scared. I'm about to go out on the road. I got my first job. I need help. I say, did you watch the clinical tips section that I have inside the course for EMTs and AOS providers, AEMT and paramedic? I have an entire section of clinical tips. Yes, it will help you with your clinical in school, uh, but it helps you out on the road when you're actually new. My friends, I have something in the course that I actually don't share publicly. I'm, I'm going to share it with you right now. Um, we have a saying in the course um, called the 100% member. Uh, one of our first 100% members was a man named Philip from Australia. Philip, if you're watching, shout out to you, sir. Um, he was one of our first 100% members. See, I can see in the course who's watched all of the videos. Philip was one of our first ones to make it to the entire course. He watched all 400 videos. He had a breakthrough case. He took literally one of the videos that he watched on sneaky diabetics and put that into his practice and was able to catch a sneaky cardiac case, thus saving a patient's life. And there are countless other stories of this. Yes, we are trained for school. Yes, we are trained for national registry, but we are really training to be the absolute best that we can be out on the road. This is why I do what I do. Because someone's aunt, uncle, cousin, dad, grandma is going to be calling you. Yes, you. For their emergency. And you're going to want to know this stuff down cold. And the thing is, if you go and you, let's say you go into a uh, class. They're going to say, hey, buy these textbooks. If the textbooks are going to cost you hundreds of dollars, some of them you might not even open up. And a lot of you, like me, don't learn good reading out textbooks. I just don't. I, I've tried. It's not impossible to do, but I do not comprehend very well at all. Maybe you're like me. Okay? So what I've done, I want to be available to the masses is it can be a lifetime access 
and the course only costs $67 for lifetime access. If that sounds like something that you want, that you want to get involved in, and you want to join the paramedic coach, coach army, we call it the success squad. Hit the link down below. I'll give you a lifetime access right now. Just for watching the live video, I'll give you a lifetime access right now. So first link in the description, you can learn more at preparedforems.com. I'm also going to put a link in the chat for you as well. This is my life's work, helping students get through school, national registry, and then I don't stop there like other programs. I want you to be great out on the road. And then I don't stop there. Um, I want you, if you get your EMT, get your AMT or get your paramedic. Remember the vision of the course. And this is, I'll tell you right now when I was speaking about this, before I put, the, I'll put the link in, in a second, put the link in the description. Um, my big vision is that people that are getting ready, which is the whole topic of this entire life. And this is not just my vision, but it's proven with student results. You can check them out on Facebook or, or Instagram or on the website too. Um, students that enter the course before they even start school, they get school and national registry so much easier. They don't have as many problems. They don't have fail, as many fail attempts. They don't have fail attempts, right? A lot of students come to me on their fifth, sixth attempt, they end up on National Registry. They end up in my messenger, in my Instagram. I might not be the first person that you come to when you're looking for National Registry prep. I might not be. I'm trying to become uh, the most known. That's why we're here, right? We might become the best, like you. But you know who I am? I'm the last one that you go to. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy that you come to when you're having these failed attempts, and then I help you with your breakthrough. So we can just skip all that and start from the start. And that is the vision here of the paramedic coach. If we prep early, we have a smooth process. I just had a student today that was saying, hey, I, I got into your course, you know, before I, I even started EMT school, I got into your course. And I had a breeze through EMT school and I went to National Registry. I passed 70 questions first try. That's what I want for you. So if you want that, click the link down below and join the video study course. You get lifetime access. And like I was saying, with the, uh, I'll put the link now, with the 100% um, with a hundred percent member that I was talking about, and there's many of them, of course. But if you were to simply just watch, you know, you know, screw, you know, screw school or screw, you know, national registry or whatever. I'm talking human to human here. If you want to be the best you can be at EMS, I've literally taken everything I've learned in my experience in my brain being a paramedic, and I've put it inside the course. All you got to do is sit back and watch it. You can watch it on your phone, you can watch it on your laptop, your iPad, anywhere you want. If you simply sit down and watch the entire course, you will literally go from beginner to an EMS expert just from watching the course. That's my promise to you. You just got to take action on it. So the link's down below, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this live. Um, man, it, I'm, I, I get I'm always honest with all of you. I always tell you how I feel at the end of the live. God, it felt so good to be live. I got to say, I miss this a lot. I really miss going live. So everybody, thank you so much for the kind words about what I do in the comments. I've seen a few people pass their registry and stuff. Where can you find me? Well, if you're a member of my course, you're going to find me in the course for sure. <laughs> you're going to get a whole lot of me in there. Um, I'm here on YouTube. I do live like this. I post content every single week. Um, there is nobody else on the entire planet Earth that posts more EMS content than me. Uh, you can look it up. No one does. Every day I post. Every single day. If I don't post content, then I'm telling you, hey, come to YouTube. I got a video. Um, check me out on TikTok. Check me out. It's the Paramedic Coach TikTok, Paramedic Coach Instagram, Paramedic Coach on Facebook. You're right here, Paramedic Coach on YouTube. And the last thing I'll have to do before you dip, my friends, tell a friend. Hit the subscribe button down below. 
We've hung out here for an hour. We just hit an hour and 40 minutes. Hit subscribe down below. Tell a friend about me so I can help your class, help you. If, you, if you're an instructor out there, tell your, tell, hey, tell your uh, classmates, and hey, my classmates, tell your students, come over here. You can you know, learn on the go with me and my friends. Thank you so much for the kind words. I will see you next time. Good night. Good luck. Let's get this stuff done. I know you can do it. Let's go.